Hello and welcome back for another Share of Sodium video. Today I'm going to share a version of a lecture that I got to give to a group of orthopedic surgery program directors. It's called the Residency Selection Arms Race, how orthopedic surgery program directors can transform medical education. Thanks so much for inviting me here today. I'm here to make the case that you all, the audience, the people in this very room, can improve residency selection ensure the bright future of the field of orthopedic surgery and transform medical education for the better. So here's what I'm going to talk to you about today. Sports. I'm going to share with you three stories about sports. Each one is going to illustrate something important that's directly applicable to your job as program director selecting the future of your profession. And each one is going to end with some questions. Because my goal here is really not to be prescriptive and presume that I know how best to do your job. Instead, my goal is to stimulate your analytical mind and your imagination. I'm going to tell you some stories and I'm going to make some observations. Some are going to be concrete and some are going to be philosophical that in the immediate term will stimulate a good discussion. But ultimately, I hope they're going to plant seeds that eventually will blossom into positive change. Chapter one. This is Jesse Owens. He's maybe the greatest athlete in track and field history. At the 1936 Olympics, Owens won gold medals for the long jump, the 100 meters, the 200 meters, and the 4x100 meter relay. Of course, the 1936 Olympics were held in Berlin, so Owens' victories weren't just athletic feats. Each gold medal was incredibly symbolic because it dealt a blow to Adolf Hitler's notion of white supremacy. Now, when Owens ran the 100 meter dash, it was not a close race. He was clearly ahead of the pack after 30 meters, and by the time he crossed the finish line, the nearest German was still 0.4 seconds behind him, which really is an eternity at this distance. But here's the thing. Owens ran that 100-meter dash in 10.3 seconds. In the 2020 Olympics, the minimum qualifying time was 10.05 seconds. So Jesse Owens, I mean, he's one of the greatest, if not the greatest, track athletes who ever lived. But if he came back today and duplicated his world record shattering runs from the 1930s, he wouldn't even make the U.S. Olympic team. It goes to show just how much has changed over the years. And, you know, I hear this kind of thing from physicians when they talk about residency selection. Oh, these applicants today, they're so much better than I was. I'd be lucky to match if I applied today. And, and when they say that, usually everybody chuckles at the self-deprecating humor. And let me tell you, it's true. Residency selection, um, you know, it's a different ball game than it used to be even a few years ago. But I think if you scratch below the surface of that, what you find isn't really that funny. I think what you find is actually quite troubling and deserving of careful consideration because left unaddressed, it threatens the future of medical education and the well-being of the future physician workforce and our patients. Here's the root of the issue. What I'm showing you here are some data from the NRMP. It shows the number of match applicants, that's the red curve, and the number of first year residency positions available, that's the blue curve. What you can see is that uh, if you go back to the late 80s, early 90s, the number of residency positions and the number of applicants for those positions, those numbers were nearly identical. Actually, if you go back even farther to the, to the very beginning of the match in the 1950s, there were significantly more positions available than there were applicants. Back then, hospitals used to compete for residents, and many hospitals went home empty-handed. That was the cause of the early, high-pressure, exploding offers that necessitated the formation of the match in the first place. But since the 19, early 1990s, the situation has been reversed. The number of applicants has consistently outpaced the number of positions available. What that means is that the nature of the competition in the match has changed. Instead of some hospitals going home empty-handed on match day, it's the applicants. Here's what this looks like for orthopedics. As you all know, orthopedic surgery is one of the most sought-after specialties in all of medicine. Only around 70% of medical students who dream of being an orthopedic surgeon are going to get that opportunity. My point is, there's scarcity. And this graphic only addresses that scarcity on the most superficial level because there's also scarcity in the nature of positions available or their geographic location or any other variable that impacts their desirability to applicants. And when there's scarcity, there's going to be competition. 
and applicants today are competing ever more intensely to obtain this scarce resource. They're competing with each other in the number of applications that they submit because, all other things being equal, an applicant who submits more applications gains an advantage over one who submits fewer. This is the phenomenon that I call application fever. Back in 2007, when I graduated from medical school, the average US medical student submitted around 31 residency applications. I myself submitted only about 10. By 2020, that figure had increased to 70, and international medical graduates submit even more, a mean of 139 apiece in 2020. And again, that figure is up substantially from just a decade ago. I'd like to give you figures from more recent years, but um, actually after I started publicizing this graphic, the AMC stopped reporting the overall average number of applications submitted. But they still give us the specialty specific figures, and as you already know, orthopedic surgery has been on the front lines of the applications arms race. Here's some numbers from last year's cycle. As you can see, the typical orthopedic surgery applicant submitted 83.9 applications, which is actually down slightly from the year before, but let's be honest, it's still a ton of applications. This kind of over-application is expensive for applicants. To submit that many applications, I mean, it costs thousands of dollars, and um, in the aggregate, over-application doesn't benefit applicants. There can only be a certain number of winners, and overall, match rates are unchanged, regardless of how many programs applicants submit their applications to. So another way of looking at this is that applicants are paying more and more just to achieve the same outcome that collectively they did in the past. And over-application doesn't benefit program directors either. The average program gets 100 applications for every position they're trying to fill, and some get more than that. You guys need more applications like you need a hole in the head. And yet this deluge of applications leaves many programs buried so deep that the only way they can dig out is by using convenience metrics to screen applications and thin the pile to an amount that a homo sapien can actually read. Now the most convenient of all the convenience metrics is a USMLE score filter. And as more and more programs use these filters, applicants began competing more and more to get a high score and USMLE scores accordingly began to steadily rise. This is how this looks in orthopedic surgery, and you can see there's a steady rise in USMLE scores for applicants who successfully matched, around 15 points for step one and 20 points for step two CK, just over the past 15 years. If you think those figures are impressive, I really got something for you here, because that graphic really doesn't do justice to just how much the average USMLE score has risen over time. These tables here, I think, do a better job. Now here, it's critically important for you to realize that USMLE score reporting scale, it hasn't changed. That scale, it doesn't get recentered every few years like a norm reference test like the SAT. Students today score higher because they, honest to God, answer more questions correctly than students did years ago. So if you go back to the earliest days of the USMLE Step 1 exam, as you can see here, the mean score was 200, perfectly respectable score. In the final days of the scored step one examination though, a 200 would have put you in the fifth percentile. Or take a look at USMLE step two CK. In 1994, if you got a 247, that puts you in the top 1% of all test scores. These days, that performance would actually be below the median. Again, let me emphasize that in terms of medical knowledge, an applicant who scores a 247 today is identical to an applicant who scored a 247 in 1994. It's only their relative performance that differs. If absolute medical knowledge was what we cared about, then within the limitations of this measurement, both applicants possess equally as much of it and are equally prepared for residency training. And when you realize that, it's fascinating to contemplate how many residents in previous eras have gone on to complete residency, gainfully practice medicine, serve patients and their communities, contribute to research and scholarship, work as program directors, lead academic departments and institutions, all while seemingly blissfully unencumbered by entering residency with an objectively determined amount of medical knowledge that would get them screened out of their residency programs today. And of course, it's not just standardized test scores where applicants are competing. It's everything else in the application too. This graphic shows the number of PubMed indexed research papers with medical student authors, 
which has increased by a factor of six just over the past 10 to 15 years. Now it could be that we're just entering a new renaissance of medical science and that this surge in research productivity is just flourishing knowledge. But I think it's naive to think this is anything other than the effects of residency selection. Applicants with more research experience are more successful in matching to competitive specialties and programs and applicants work to give programs what they want. Here's another figure showing you the same thing. These data are from the NRMP, and they show you the average number of research abstracts, presentations, and publications reported on the ARIS application for successful MD students over the past 15 years. Take note that that number has nearly quadrupled. Now this graphic is for all comers, but let me show you what it looks like for orthopedics specifically. Here, the blue bars show the number of research items for successfully matched orthopedic applicants. The red bars show the number of research items for orthopedic surgery applicants who didn't match. So in 2022, the average successful orthopedic surgery applicant had 16.5 research items on their ARIS application. It's more than twice the national average. Go back to 2007, and that number was three. Three. To me, what's most impressive about this figure actually is to look at the red bars, the ones for the unmatched applicants. The average unmatched applicant in 2022 still had 12.1 research items. In other words, the average unmatched applicant today has more research experience than the average matched applicant from 2018, and nearly twice as much as the average successful applicant in 2014. Let me show you one more battlefield, and then I'll stop. Away rotations. These are data from the AMC's graduation questionnaire, and they show how many away rotations applicants completed. I use the class of 2020 data to minimize disruptions from COVID. Now again, this is all specialties. So 45% of students didn't do any away rotations, but the majority of students did at least one, and around one in six students was doing three or more away rotations. And here's what this looks like for orthopedics. 98.9% .9 of applicants do at least one away rotation. I wish I could give you the precise distribution of exactly how many away rotations each applicant is doing, but the AMC doesn't provide that information, unfortunately. However, they do tell us that the median number of away rotations per applicant is three. I wish also that I could give you some idea about how rapidly the number of away rotations has increased over time. But historical data on away rotations are hard to come by, presumably because students in previous eras were doing them so infrequently that it never became a focus of serious academic inquiry. And just like for USMLE scores and research, it's not hard to understand why students want to do away rotations. It's because program directors want them to. Surveys have shown that the fraction of orthopedic surgery applicants who match at a program where they did an away rotation is 40% or higher. So what's my point? What's the lesson that I want you to take from this chapter? I think the point is that we're in the midst of a great residency selection arms race. In an arms race, it doesn't matter what you have in an absolute sense. It only matters how much you have relative to your competitors. Think back about Jesse Owens, one of the best athletes of his era, maybe one of the best athletes in history. Relative to his competition, he was head and shoulders above the rest. But in an absolute sense, in 2023, he wouldn't have even won the NCAA Division III 100-meter race with his legendary performance at the 1936 Olympics time, at least. Residency selection is a competition, and there can be, I think, this belief that competition is always a good thing. Competition forces competitors to do their best and then do better. You know, when, when Hollywood studios compete to win Oscars, we all win because we get to watch better movies. When Samsung and Apple compete to make the best cell phone, we all end up with a better phone in our pocket. And at first glance, aren't all these previous slides just showing you the same thing? I mean, who doesn't want their doctor to have more medical knowledge? Rising USMLE scores are a good thing. Research is a good thing. Who doesn't want more of it? But here's where things start to break down. Because if you follow that out, by almost any measurable standard, today's medical students are better than those from previous eras. So where are the trumpets and fanfare? Why are we not celebrating this 
grand new era, this golden age of medicine that, that surely we must be entering? The answer, I think, is that there's an important distinction to be made between a competition that produces a social good, a virtuous competition, and an arms race in which the competitors wastefully invest more and more resources just to maintain a relative advantage. Arms races hurt the competitors. At the height of the Cold War, the Soviet Union had enough nuclear arms to blow up every city and strategic target in the United States three times over. They didn't need that many nuclear bombs. Um, you know, I, I think nuking each of us just once would have been plenty. But the reason that they needed to have three bombs for every city is because we had five nuclear bombs for every Soviet city. And as they poured more and more money into their military, it came at the expense of other things, which of course is one reason among many that the Soviet Union collapsed. Does that remind you of anything? The only reason an applicant needs a 260 on step two is because the average applicant is now pushing 240. The only reason you need to apply to 100 residency programs is because your competition is applying to 85. It doesn't matter what it is, you just need more of it. So my question is, is that really what we want? More, more, more. Or at some point, do the marginal gains from competition begin to eat away at the talents and attributes that we might like to cultivate? And that brings me to chapter two. In this chapter, we're going to talk about the NFL. The NFL is the most competitive sports league on the planet. If you think residency selection is stressful, try the NFL draft. The fates of franchises, the happiness of entire cities, and indeed the careers of coaches and executives depend on a handful of decisions that get made on one day in April. And of all the positions on the football field, drafting a quarterback is probably the most important. You can't win without a good quarterback. And it's probably the hardest position to fill. Um, you know, there are probably only around 100 human beings on the planet at a given time who can really play that position with the requisite proficiency to lead an NFL team. And maybe only 10 or 15 of those guys can do it well enough to lead their team to the Super Bowl. So deciding who you want as your quarterback is a decision of incredible importance. So for this case study, we're going to go back to the 2018 NFL draft, and we're going to come in at the number eight pick. There were a few quarterbacks available in the draft that year, but by the time we got to number eight, the two that were everyone's favorites were already gone. Still, teams in search of a quarterback had a few good options available. So with the number 10 pick, the Arizona Cardinals selected Josh Rosen. No other team took a quarterback until the final pick of the first round when the Baltimore Ravens selected Lamar Jackson at number 32. Now this would not have been surprising at all if you'd been following college football recruiting. Actually, maybe the only thing that would have surprised you was that Lamar Jackson got drafted at all. Because back in 2015, when Rosen and Jackson were high school seniors, Rivals, the recruiting service, had Rosen ranked as a five-star prospect. He was the number one overall quarterback in the class and the number 11 prospect in the whole nation. He was everything that a college scout could have wanted. He had an athletic pedigree. His father had been a nationally ranked figure skater. His mom played varsity lacrosse at Princeton. Before he started to focus on football, Rosen had been a nationally ranked youth tennis player. In high school, he had a 4.3 GPA. He graduated a semester early so he could start his college football career. And he did all that while he threw for 11,000 yards and 90 touchdowns, and he never lost a league football game as a starter. Jackson, in contrast, was a three-star prospect. Rivals had him ranked as the 12th best dual threat quarterback and the 409th best prospect overall. Actually, many of the big-name schools that initially recruited him didn't even envision he would play quarterback. They wanted to switch him to wide receiver. He ended up committing to Louisville only after the coach promised his mother that if he committed there, he would only play quarterback. Obviously, though, with the benefit of hindsight, we know that Jackson ended up being the better NFL quarterback. And it's not even close. Jackson has gone on to become one of the top quarterbacks in the league with a 74% lifetime win percentage as a starter and a QB rating of 96. He was the NFL MVP unanimously in 2019. In contrast, as an NFL quarterback, Rosen was a bust. He lasted only a year as a starter for the Cardinals before bouncing around at six other teams as a backup. His only NFL record is not the kind of record you want to hold. He had the lowest passer rating in the league for the one year that he served as a starter. Now, it's easy to say 
what's the big deal? The NFL draft is full of busts and surprises, and as far as that goes, Rosen is far from being the biggest bust in NFL history, and Jackson is far from being the biggest surprise. So some of you may wonder why I picked this example and what on earth it's supposed to tell us about residency selection. So I picked this example for two reasons. One is that I'm an unapologetic Ravens fan, and getting the chance to talk about that on a national stage was an opportunity I wasn't going to miss. Second, there's actually an incredibly important lesson in this N equals 1 example that does apply to residency selection. And that lesson is this. There is a distinction between performance and potential, but too often we conflate the two. This is the most important thing that I want you to see when we rewind the tape on Josh Rosen and Lamar Jackson. The scouts that fell in love with Josh Rosen, they weren't wrong. His performance as a quarterback in high school was as good as you could get. But uh, he did have a lot of advantages to get there. Um, his great-great-grandfather was uh, the businessman for whom the Wharton School of Business is named. His mother's maiden name is Lippincott, the same Lippincott as the famous ac academic medicine publishing house. His parents both graduated from Ivy League universities and were high-level athletes in their own right. His father is actually an orthopedic surgeon and was on President Obama's short list of nominees for Surgeon General. Rosen grew up in Southern California, which is a hotbed of football competition that's famous for producing quarterbacks. And he attended St. John Bosco High School, an elite private school in Los Angeles, whose football teams run a pro-style offense and have won three national championships. Look, Rosen had a lot of God-given football talent, but he also had a stable family, some financial resources, and top-notch coaching from a very early age to help him maximize that talent. In contrast, Lamar Jackson grew up in Florida, which is also a hotbed of football talent, but interestingly is an area that's more famous for producing athletes rather than quarterbacks. His dad died suddenly when he was eight years old, leaving his mother to raise Lamar and his siblings alone. He didn't even play high school football when he was a sophomore, and he played his 11th and 12th grade seasons for a public high school whose test scores indicate that 23% of their students are proficient in math, according to the state standard, and whose football team had never won a state championship, much less a national one. Rosen was absolutely the more accomplished quarterback in high school. He might have had a lot of opportunities, but he did a lot with it. His performance was second to none. At the same time, though, Lamar Jackson showed signs of, of the kind of potential that he could have at the next level. There's a video you can watch on YouTube that, that shows him heaving a football 95 yards in the air as a high schooler. And his coach says that he's never had a player before or since who had Jackson's work ethic. My point here is that performance is a function of both potential and opportunity. So let me give you one quick example, one additional example from the NFL. Here are all the starting quarterbacks for week one of last year's NFL season. And here's an interesting statistic. Half of those quarterbacks have birthdays in just three months of the year, August, September, and October. Now, at first glance, that may be puzzling, um, but it's not puzzling at all when you remember that youth football leagues typically use August as a cutoff date for determining eligibility. What that means is that on average, the biggest, fastest, and strongest player on a peewee youth football team is the oldest. And those players attract the most attention from the coaches. And in turn, their performance gets better, which attracts more attention from the next level of coaches. Some economists call this the Matthew effect after the biblical story of the parable of the talents. For he who has, more will be given. For he who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So let me bring it back to residency selection because I don't want anyone to mistake what I'm trying to say here. You often hear that past performance is the best predictor of future performance, and that's true, at least if we're talking about the short term and we're talking about substantially similar tasks. So if you want to have residents who will pass their ABOS exams, using USMLE scores to pick those residents makes some sense. If you want residents who will not cause any trouble, who show up on time and will be respectful to their attendings, well, look at clerkship grades. That's probably a good surrogate for that kind of substantially similar task. But what if, as a program director, what if you have goals beyond those things? What if you dream of your program training not just a solid resident, but someone who becomes a leader in the field? 
What if you want to train a surgeon who will be an innovator or who inspires others? What if you want to judge the success of your recruitment, not by their PGY1 ITE score, but by the impact that they've had on your field in 20 years? Well, that's hard. So the second thing that I want you to think about tonight is, what do you really want to accomplish in residency selection? Because this is no small thing. Uh, you know, as you saw, many applicants who dream of being orthopedic surgeons, they simply will not get that opportunity. The priorities that you choose to set and the decisions that you make as gatekeepers as you evaluate performance and potential, they will have profound effects on the future of your specialty. Next, chapter three, a story about basketball. You know, the NBA today is a business powerhouse. It is a wildly successful league. It brings in $10 billion a year in revenue, attracts the top talent from all across the world, and fills the dreams of any kid who ever stood in their driveway and shot a basketball. But if you go back to 1979, the NBA was in real danger. And the way that they got out of danger and became the wildly successful league that we know today, that teaches us another valuable lesson. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the premise, um, basketball is a game that involves making a ball pass through a hoop that's 10 feet off the ground. So all other things being equal, the taller you are, the easier it is to get the ball over your opponents or keep them from getting the ball over you. If you're a coach or a manager, there's a definite formula to winning in the NBA. You found the tallest guy you could, you park him right under the bucket, and you have everyone else work to get him the ball and let him do his thing. For as long as there had been professional basketball, that's how you won in the NBA. Pictured here is George Mikan, one of the NBA's first stars. He stood six foot ten, and as you can see from this picture, he could very nearly dunk the basketball without even jumping. One way you can quantify just how valuable it was for teams to have a tall player as the focal point of their offense is to look at MVP awards, the award that goes to the single most valuable player in the league. Pictured here are the NBA's biggest stars in the 1960s, Bill Russell and Will Chamberlain. Russell stood 6'10", Chamberlain was 7'1". Between the two of them, they won nine NBA MVP awards. Actually, in the first few decades of the NBA, there was widespread consensus that the most valuable player in the league was a center, who typically is the tallest player on the floor. Centers won almost 85% of all MVP awards before 1979. Small forwards and shooting guards won zero. Their job was really just to get the ball in to the big man. And this trend continued until the 1970s when you had a different generation of big men, players like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Bill Walton, Moses Malone, all winning MVPs. So this was definitely the way that you won basketball games. But it turned out it wasn't the way that you won fans. Because after rapid growth in the 1950s, 60s, and early 70s, by the late 1970s, the NBA was stagnant. Games had become plodding and predictable. Arena attendance was down. Actually, some games of the 1979 NBA Finals weren't even broadcast on live TV. They were shown on tape delay. NBA executives knew they had to do something drastic. So here's what they did. They drew an extra line on the court. Here's the headline from June 22, 1979 in the New York Times, NBA to institute three-point field goal. Before the three-point shot, uh, you know, if every shot from anywhere on the floor is worth two points, well, where do you want to shoot it from? The answer was as close to the hoop as possible. But when you made outside shots more valuable, players started taking them. And now defenses had to guard those players, and that opened up the rest of the floor. The three-point shot changed the game. And look what it did to the MVP award. With a three-point shot, sharpshooters like Steph Curry became very valuable. And with defenses stretched out, shooting guards like Michael Jordan and forwards like LeBron, they had more room to operate, and their skills became more valuable. You could win with a distributor like Magic or Steve Nash, a slasher like Iverson, or a floor general like Bird or Duncan. Having a three-point shot made the game more balanced. But importantly, it didn't take away the value of having a good center. Um, you know, Nikola Jokic has won two out of the past three MVP awards. Here's the recent distribution of NBA MVP awards by player position. On the left is the old graph that shows what things looked like before the three-point shot. On the right, you can see what things look like afterwards. And you can see that the number of MVP awards is almost perfectly balanced across the five floor positions. 
So let's think about what this can teach us about residency selection. Drawing an extra line on the court didn't suddenly endow human beings with some previously unknown new skill. What it did was create a system to formally recognize talent that was there all along by giving an incentive for those who possessed this kind of talent to develop it fully. And ultimately, it made the game better. My point is this. If your system recognizes only one kind of excellence, you'll get it. But you'll leave a lot of other talent on the table. The rules we choose determine the type of talent that we recognize. And I think the very best systems allow multiple types of excellence to flourish simultaneously. Before I close with the big questions, I want to quickly summarize the lessons that I hope I've covered. First, from thinking about Jesse Owens, we're in the midst of a residency selection arms race. Applicants today are unquestionably doing more. And more is more, but is more better? Second, from Lamar Jackson, we often conflate past performance with potential, but performance is a function of both talent and the opportunity to develop it. And if you really want to gauge someone's potential, you ought to consider how much of a contribution each of these factors made. And last, from the NBA and the three-point line experience, the rules that you choose determine the type of talent that you recognize. Now, here's what I really want to talk about, because back at the beginning, I promised that um, I would tell you all how you could change medical education for the better. And at this point, I hope I've built the foundation and raised some questions about the way that we're doing things. But now I want to take it one step further. Residency selection is a competition. There are not enough spots for everyone. On match day, some applicants will win and some applicants will lose. And if you look at residency selection as a competition and you look at it only through the lens of these individual applicants, then it's a zero sum game. You all could choose the next generation of orthopedic surgeons by their USMLE scores or by who could remember the most digits of pi, or you could choose them by random lottery. And whatever system you choose, only 70% of applicants are going to win. Now, if you choose by USMLE scores, a different 70% may win than if you choose by lottery. But everyone who wins is offset by someone who loses. But if you look at residency selection from a broader standpoint, beyond the payoffs to individual applicants, I hope you can see that it's not a zero-sum game. If the residency selection arms race teaches us nothing else, it should teach us that applicants will rise to the bar that you set. You want high USMLE scores? Applicants will give them to you. You want research? Check out this list of citations. You say jump, applicants will say how high. If you provide incentives for applicants to acquire meaningful skills or to make the world a better place, they will do that too. And the thing you need to remember is this, the people who are unsuccessful at getting into orthopedic res surgery residencies, you know, those folks don't just disappear. They go off and practice and care for patients in other areas. So if through their residency selection competition, they learn skills that make them better physicians, then you may benefit other patients and you may make the world a better place even without changing the number of people who win by becoming an orthopedic surgeon. You are the MBA Rules Committee. You get to decide what counts and how much it counts. And sometimes when I say this, some program directors look at me funny. There's this learned helplessness that is pervasive in academic medicine. And some program directors say, what, 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 what am I supposed to do? You know, the, the schools are all pass fail. Everyone's evals look the same. Everyone's letter writers, they, they lie. You know, what am I supposed to do? So let me put it to you that you are not beholden to any of the metrics that are in existence today. You hold in your hands a powerful lever to drive the changes that you might want to see. As an orthopedic surgery program director, by merely asserting that you want to see such and such from applicants, you can very nearly speak it into existence. You don't believe me? Suppose that a few of you guys got together and decided, just for the sake of example, that you wanted medical schools to report a class rank. Some schools do it now, many don't. Well, all you all have to do is make it known that you will be prioritizing the applications of students whose schools do this. 
And I promise you, if you do that, a thousand of the best and brightest students in the United States of America will be at their dean's office advocating for that change to be made just so they don't miss out on the chance to become an orthopedic surgeon. And I say this just as an example because there's many better things you could ask for than class rank. You want medical schools to rigorously evaluate and certify their students' competency in basic suturing or reading x-rays, breaking bad news to patients, or anything else that your hearts desire. You are in a position to do it. For too long, residency programs have enabled schools to abdicate their responsibility to rigorously certify competencies, but you are in a position to change that and improve medical education and patient care for the better. What we choose to measure and how we choose to measure it are important questions. What kind of advantages should carry the day and which should be constrained? Those things will shape both medical education and the future workforce. But we need to think about how we can align the goals of medical education with residency selection so that the inevitable competition that occurs will result in more of the goods we want rather than just burning out as competitors. Dream bigger. Flex your muscles. Make the world better for everyone. Thank you for inviting me today, and thanks for listening.